Welcome everyone. This is uh, another episode with uh, Richard and another guest today. That's John. John, how are you doing? Hello, Oscar. Salam alaikum. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from beautiful Dubai. Dubai. Excellent. It's about, about 24 degrees out here. It's, just, it's a beautiful winter's morning. Um, so it, it's a very nice place. Excellent. I see you've dressed up for us. Uh, that was the first thing I noticed uh, today. One has to be professional. <laughs> Excellent. All right, let's dive into this. Uh, today, it's a subject that I'm less familiar with, but luckily you are, and I think Richard uh, also, so that makes my life a little bit easier. Um, but the first question I have is to kind of describe to me what you do. So it's a good question. So I, my banner is around agile and digital transformation. I, I dropped the digital transformation some years ago and it mostly been agile, but with COVID, digital came back again. So that's, that's gone back onto the, um, onto the placard. But what that means is that I do advisory work with executives. So I, I talk with executives about how to um, make their organisations more agile and more adaptive. And then uh, I do a lot of educational design. So I'll create courses uh, inside organisations, deliver those courses. And then I'll do a lot of ongoing mentoring and coaching with the various executives that are undergoing that, that transformation. So you've already offered up a, a, a perfect first segue, John. Okay. You've, you've used the word agile and adaptive in the same sentence. Sure. Uh, what's the difference? <clears throat> okay, so... Agile is a, is a word which is, is quite commodified. So it's in one, in one sense, the purists have come out of the agile movement, the agile software delivery movement, the agile manifesto. Um, it's, there's a lot of causes, a lot of, a lot of confusion about what agile means. Does agile mean scrum? Does agile mean um, safe? Um, does it agile make a business more agile? What does safe mean, John, just in case someone doesn't understand Agile that? Agile framework. So, Agile framework, okay. So it is, it is a structure which is being marketed and sold as a way to um, implement Agile within organisations. Uh, it's got a very poor reputation with the Agile purists, uh, but a lot of companies seem to be buying it. A lot of people are, you know, you know, are implementing it. But... The reason that I talk about adaptive is, is I'm take, trying to take it up a level intellectually and trying to understand what the purpose of what we're trying to do is. And with the agile software delivery, so we go back to those roots, then it was around about delivering software where the requirements were changing. So in other words, delivering software into a complex environment. And so in some ways, what it was doing is it was adapting the software to ever-changing requirements. So if you're talking about a large project that takes maybe six months, a couple of years, then the, the world is moving on very quickly in IT um, uh, terms. So the software's, the underlying software is changing, the underlying hardware is changing, um, and the customer requirements are changing. So by the time you start a project and deliver it, um, in the old way, in the waterfall way, you were delivering software which was Know, partially redundant by the time it was delivered. And so Agile came along and they created an iterative approach to delivering software. So you deliver the software in little increments, things that the customers could use, but it wouldn't be a linear path. But what would happen is that as you deliver parts of the software, customers would then uh, have different requirements. They say, oh, I didn't realize we could do that. Let's do this. And so it would change. And so anyway, the word Agile stuck. Um, it was just a word which which they came up with, the, the founders of the manifesto came up with, the, um, someone was reading a book and it had the word agile in it, so they used the word agile. But where I'm coming from, I try to take it up a level and I'm trying to resolve what we're trying to do here, which is organise work, uh, into a theoretical framework. And the theoretical framework or the assembly of theoretical frameworks, which I use is from complex adaptive systems. And so when I talk about adaption, I'm really talking about adaption from a complex adaptive systems perspective. 
So in simple terms, what you're trying to do is, in, in the agile world, the, the developer talks to a customer and the customer says, oh, this is what we need. And then you go through an iterative process where that they, they, they change the software to in, in align with the, the customer's requirements. You're trying to do this in, in a way in which corporate executives uh, somehow talk with the external environment, the market, and then create a similar process uh, at the higher levels of organization. Yes? Not, not quite. Close. So in the same way as you quite, quite accurately said, this is if we have a software product, and what we're going to do is we're going to adapt that software market to the environment. What I'm trying to do is say, well, how do we adapt the whole organization to its changing environment continuously? So it, it's, a, it's a dramatically different scope. And so that, that's, that's an interest, because for me, that this is the, the really interesting shift. So you've gone from you know, a small little project or, or even a complex uh, software project where the information is being exchanged in, in conversational lines between customer and, and, the, um, and the developers. With, a, an agile, with an adaptive organizational change where you're, you're trying to adapt the entire organization to shifting environments, where's the conversation happening or is conversation the wrong word? There's lots of conversations happening. So, so let's just start very simply. And we start with, with our software development team and one team is developing one product for one particular uh, customer segment or customer persona. So then you've got an agile team. And now you've got another agile team producing another product. Now, as it turns out, you can also take agile methods and give them to marketing. So now you've got a marketing team over here starting to think more iteratively around marketing. So now we've got, we've got some cells operating in an agile way. But when we're trying to get big things done, we, we they interface with bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy kills the connections between the different cells. And so a complex adaptive system is, is basically a network of adaptive agents. And so we can think of your different product teams as agents. We can classify it like that. And an adaptive organization is where these agents are working autonomously within themselves. They're also communicating in a network as opposed to communicating in a, in a top-down hierarchy. And that's the difference. So, just a question for you, John. So, you, you mentioned that that the pain point is bureaucracy, right? Um, yeah. Why is this? Why is that the pain point? Because is if you bureaucracy has its role as well within the business where you need to have operational systems in place, right? But the way you describe it, that at least in its current form, bureaucracy is actually a hindrance. Mm. <laughs> We've only got an hour, have we? <laughs> okay. So, so the, the problem, so what, what is bureaucracy? In order for me to answer that question, we've got to help what is bureaucracy. So bureaucracy literally means the rule of the desks. And so what it's about, it's about the idea of se separating work, demarcating work functions, breaking the job down into its component bits, and then having hierarchical level of control. So a, a superior um, creates the work and orders a subordinate to do the work and the subordinate um, reports up to the superior. And then that's done at scale. So you, that's why you get your traditional pyramid architecture. But what that means is the decision making goes towards the top. And so when you have in an autonomous um, environment, if you're making decisions at the coalface um, about operational decisions, about what products to launch, what products to, to you know, how to, to fund them, where to go. But if you're constrained by, by decision-making bureaucracies, the decisions to be able to go forward are done at the top, then that destroys the autonomy. So, for example, one of the things which... I often do is I'll go in and I'll try and I'll create some agile software teams. And I'll be working with the agile software teams to teach them how to um, 
listen to the market, how to create stories, how to um, use um, techniques, maybe Scrum, or maybe we adapt Scrum in order to iterate this work. Now, part of that is that, as Richard said, is that their job is to listen to the customer and to prioritise what the work is in the order and, and to ship increments. Now, in a bureaucracy, what will happen is that someone at the top will say, or someone above them will say, no, no, we're going to reprioritise. Stop what you're doing and do this. And so all of a sudden, the momentum of that autonomous team is killed by an order coming from above just to change the priorities. And when this happens enough, what happens is the energy goes out of this team and they, they end up becoming, it becomes sort of a pseudo agile where they're kind of doing scrum, they're kind of doing their job, but really they're waiting for commands to come from the top. They give up with the autonomy. And so that's the problem. That's one of the problems with, with, with bureaucracy is that you're waiting for commands to come from the top. You're waiting for the strategy to come from the top. And the other thing is you're waiting for your information flows are vertical. So what tends to happen is you tend to report up the line and then the person at the top of the tree or the top of a branch then sends that signal down. Whereas in an, in an autonomous system, what we really want is we want a mesh of communication networks. And bureaucracy often gets in the way of this, this mesh of communication networks. So I, I'm, I'm going to put on a pretend um, corporate executive hat and, yeah. and say, well, John, that sounds like chaos. Um, so how, how do you... How do you explain the fact that it's not chaos? And I know scientifically it isn't, that it's a different science than, than, than chaos science. So how do, you, how do you persuade them that it's not chaos? And then once you persuaded them it's not chaos and then it's something else going on, how do you give them a sense of control or a sense of faith that this is working? Right. So <laughs> you've gone straight, straight to the heart of the problem, straight to the heart of the problem. So what we have is we have a problem with paradigm alignment. And so if, I'm, if I've got a certain paradigm, and my paradigm is complex adaptive systems or agile, but the executives I'm talking to and their paradigm is managerial hierarchies. And we're, any propositions, you know, uh, you know, a proposition only makes sense to the paradigm that it belongs within. And so if you've got these two competing paradigms or two, two divergent paradigms, you can't have any communication, you can't have any meaning, meaningful discourse between those paradigms. Each party doesn't make sense to the other party. And so what I'm finding I'm doing is spending a lot of time trying to migrate the, the cognitive framework, which I use, complex adaptive systems, to the executive team. So a lot of what I'm doing is actually trying to teach executives the basic operations of complex adaptive systems. And when I say basic operations, I'm not talking about dumbing it down, but I'm talking about demathematizing it. So it's still robust, complex science, but we're trying to get to the, to the, the, the core of it so that the business people can understand it. And what I found is that if you're patient and if the executives are patient, and they're obviously very intelligent people, they can start to absorb some of the science behind complex adaptive systems. And as they do that, then all of a sudden the propositions, are, are, so for a such, such an example for autonomy, it makes sense. But if you try to say, yes, we want to make these, these cells autonomous, and in your mind, in your framework, your conceptual framework, it all makes sense because, you know, hey, we're a self-adapting system. We're an autonomous system. Our organs hang together and our blood hangs together and it all works. But if your framework of understanding is a bureaucracy where things are as component parts, it's mechanistic, reductionistic paradigm, then these two paradigms clash. And so what I'm trying to do is slowly migrate this knowledge to, to the executives. And I say it slowly because it's actually quite a large body of knowledge. You kind of got to go bit by bit. And then what happens is that those executives start to understand more and they start, they start, to, they start to tilt. It's a slow process. Can you, can you um, explain any success stories you've had in, in sort of these 
micro moments where they begin to understand it or uh, a sort of that they're ready to take the leap of faith or are there any clues as, as to where they are on, on the journey? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a few, there's a few things. So um, when I say we're bringing the, the, the realm of complex science to, to business administration, let's break that down because complexity science has got a lot of different um, disciplines within it. Uh, but there's a, couple of, there's a couple of key ones which are very good. So one of them is information theoretics. So this is Shannon information, how information moves throughout a system. Another one is, is adaption, Darwinian adaption. Um, and there's a few others. Now, these things are fairly easy to explain. And so, for example, um, when I'm talking about trying to... Um, help organizations create an adaptive strategy, one of the impulses from the, from the bureaucratic days is to say, what we need is a five-year plan. We need a five-year vision and, we, and then we have a management by objectives and all this will trickle down. And so they have put a lot of faith into creating one or two big products that are gonna work. But by explaining how Darwinian adaption works, which is basically lots of experiments and so a species will have lots of produce, uh, offspring, and there's random mutations in that offspring, and some of those offspring survive, and some of them don't. And so if we take that metaphor to product management, we say, look, why don't we create a multitude of different products rather than put all of our eggs in one or two product baskets? Why don't we launch 10 or 20 small products to start with and see how they go in the market? Run multiple parallel experiments. It's exactly the same way nature does. And we know that some of these are going to die and some of these are going to work. And that simple explanation, that simple metaphor, because we look around and we can see this is how nature works, this is how nature evolves. It can work. And I can take it a little bit more advanced. I can actually introduce them to a, an ecological tool called a fitness landscape and we can, we can talk about the traits. We can take it a bit further. But it starts with a very simple idea where nature adapts and how do species adapt or populations of species adapt and how do we take that, that metaphor to business? But it's more than a metaphor because we can mathematically model um, adaption. There's, there's equations for it and there's, there's, we've got maths for it and those same equations can translate to organisations as well. So it's not just saying let's be a little bit like nature. It's actually um, using the science of complex adaptive systems and the observation of how adaption works in nature and, and recruiting that knowledge to deploy in organisations. The question I have for you, John, um, I know you're talking about this uh, autonomous cells and, and, and the transition from bureaucracy to... to um, to this particular uh, state, how do you transition this? So let's say I'm, uh, as uh, Richard said, so I'm the CEO of a conventional bureaucratic um, business and you come in, how do you transition going from bureaucracy to what you are explaining in terms right. of... Uh, so we start where we are. So, so we don't... So all of my consulting, I don't do the big bang. And so, so some of the consultants, consultancies out there, like the McKinsey's and the Boston's of the world, they'll go in and try to sell a big bang, a big bang approach where here's a new structure, uh, here's the old structure and you migrate. My approach is very different. And, and I would, and it's, one would argue it's a more of an adaptive approach where we say, all right, where is the biggest problem in the organization, where, is, where are the biggest communication bottlenecks, where are the biggest product bottlenecks. Let's create an agile team to start to work on that. And that agile team might become two teams or three teams. And once it gets to two or three teams, and what happens is we, we typically start to get a kind of a team of teams things happening. So if you've got three cells, three product teams, for example, and they need to coordinate. Then what we do is we then create a, an alignment cell. An alignment cell is basically a member of each of the other product cells who come together to align. And then part of that alignment cell might also be someone from finance, might also be someone from strategy, and might also be someone from marketing, and might 
from, from sales. And these people week, meet on a weekly basis to see how these different products are evolving and to make sure that the communication is flowing between the, te between the teams and the individuals in the teams and the organization. Now, what happens is the senior executives who are very used to um, strategy being delivered by PowerPoint slides and very used to long-term long -term lead times and, uh, and very long um, cycle times are all of a sudden seeing this team deliver products. Some of them are, are good, but some of them are going very well with very little friction, with very little, with very little management, with very little mess, and they go, that's really cool. That's fantastic. How do now do we how do we now scale that throughout the whole organization? And so we say, well, that's working quite well with that product team. Let's expand it, you know. So we might start with business to business product team. I typically work with telecommunications companies and banks. So fairly um, you know, lots of different products. And so we might say, well, you know, we might uh, work with the business to business team or we might work with the consumer team first to get these things going and then we might migrate into another one and then we might go to marketing and then bit by bit what you're doing is you're exposing more and more of the organization to this uh, adaptive or agile way of working um, to the point where they have to start restructuring and that restructuring then is done along agile lines and uh, or adaptive lines and that's how it grows and slowly the adaptive part of the organization diffuses the, the knowledge, the processes, the mechanisms start diffusing through the organization and the bureaucracy just starts to get left behind. So what you do is rather than create sort of a, you know, a classic step-based change where you say, right, here's, here's the irrational present and here's the rational future that we're going to get to and here's the stages to get to it. You're, so you've, you've, you've mapped out the future as part of before you've even started the change. What you're doing is you're mapping out the present and finding where, where blocks are, and then nudging the present into better directions. And then yes. from that nudge, then, then better and better things start to happen. So, so often it's just starts with an experiment. So there's enough now, there's enough, there's enough uh, knowledge and enough, what Agile has done is it made a lot of executives aware. And so now if you're not doing some sort of an Agile project somewhere in your organization, there's something wrong with you. And so, so the trick is to say, well, let's let's do this very well, and let's make sure that we're we're um, using these adaptive processes to in an adaptive way. So let's listen to the market very well. Let's run the experiments very well. Let's communicate very well with all the different levels of the organisation. Let's get the culture of these teams humming, and then that diffuses. And so yes, it's not this, it's not a, a change in three steps process. It's a, it is a, a very fluid, very adaptive way to change. So I've got a couple of questions around the people that are involved. And so we've, we've already sort of asked a question around the executive and how do you get around perhaps their objections. But I can see two other challenges here. So one is the middle manager of all of a sudden is sort of, oh, I've got to this position and suddenly the work's become agile and, and autonomous and I'm not managing anything anymore. So there's a bit of a... Resist, potential resistance there. So that's sort of question one. And question two is, if you talked about random mutations and, and some work and some don't. So that within a, a, an organizational system, these will be ideas. So people will be having ideas that, that then get turned into experiments. What happens if the person's always, uh, their idea is always one that fails? You know, is, are people gonna be less willing to talk up ideas just in case they're being perceived as, oh, your ideas are always bad. So that's the sort of the second question. So one, the middle manager, what, what happens to them? And two, how do you get people to continue raising ideas if they've consistently had bad ones? Okay, so the, the, the job role, the traditional job role of middle management does disappear. But that's the job role and it's not necessarily a person. So these people often have got um, very, very good organizational knowledge they know, how to, they know how to navigate the organization. And these people can fit within teams. So remember we talked about your, your, your different autonomous cells, creating products, creating software products, creating marketing products. Um, but they've still got to negotiate and they've still got to, to work with the rest of the business. And so the middle managers can 
can become resources within that communication network. They might become some sort of a champion. They might become some sort of a product manager. In an agile world, the whole idea of job title starts to fall apart because they're very dynamic. Um, but, and I remember we talked about this idea of, of, of paradigm alignment. So if you go, well, there's no such thing as, there's no role for middle managers and um, they see agile coming, there's going to be a lot of resistance and, and you often see that. But if you, if the paradigms are around creating, maximizing the collective intelligence or the collective computational ability of the organization, which is one of the other complex adaptive theories we're going to bring across, then what we're really looking for is, is very good. Um, we were looking for, for people that can make com communication flow. And in some ways, isn't it what a middle manager used to do? Wasn't it all about communication flow? You know, so, so if they can get communication flowing around the organization, forget about the title, that can be you know, a lot of work for them within the organization. Um, so they are the ones that, you know, when we have these alignment cells, they tend to be the ones that are facilitating those alignment cells. Okay. So there, there's a transition. But in terms of your layering, the, the, in the middle layer, it, it disappears. But those people um, can, can diffuse within the organisation, given that there, there's no downscaling requirement. Sometimes people go into an agile transformation with a view to reducing headcount, and they can do that. And, and often the headcount is... is, is but the problem is not the middle manager per se, it's, it's kind of a bureaucratic mindset. So again, if we, just, if we start with paradigm alignment, then it becomes a lot easier, a lot more palatable for everyone at every level of the organisation to digest. Most of my work is working with middle managers and my work is not um, uh, outsourcing them or getting rid of them, it's teaching them how to become uh, to take their leadership skills and take their organisation skills and apply it in adaptive organisations. That was question one. Question two was about the idea of, of, of um, ideas. Having, having bad ideas. But I've, I've got a little bit of a, a, an add-on to question one before we go there, John. Um, so what you're basically suggesting is the middle manager is, is reimagined as a sense maker and a navigator and an interpreter and an explorer across the organizational horizontals um, where, where they're, they're, the, they're the ones that keep the communication flowing. Think about a network and um, there's, there's a concept we call, we call hypergraph, but I'll, I won't get to the hypergraph at the moment. But you've got a network and with those networks and think about a product team as being a cluster of nodes. And over here, you've got another net, another product team and that's another cluster of nodes. Now there's a, a there's a role for a node in between to make this, these communications happen, and what that really means in real life is there's a lot of facilitation. So they are the ones that will make meetings make meetings happen on time. When um, Richard over here in, in, in product team A and and Oscar over here in product team B, and they're too busy to come to the meetings, John the the node says, guys, we signed up. We said this the the communication meeting intercommunication meeting is more important. We can't, you know, so, so they are leading these intercommunication nodes. So they're facilitating communication and often they're the ones who, you know, Richard's product and Oscar's product, we need a bit more, we need a bit more um, money for them. And because you are much more product focused, you're less finance focused, but because, because I come from middle management, you asked me to go and see if I can have a chat to the, to the finance people to release more funds. So that's the type of role which they 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 they, they take on. All right, thanks. So that go back to the, the other question. So the the person who's had numerous bad ideas in a row. So they they've had ideas that have become experiments and they've all failed. What how how does that person you know what happens to that person? Well, I'm not too sure why an individual would be having experiments. I think that the team would be the one having experiments. Well, well the, the team themselves. Then. So if a, te if a team has constantly come up with, with experimental ideas and, and they fail, there's been a consistent rate of failure. There's never been an idea that's gone to market. What, what happens to that team? Because there's, there's got to be awareness that 
I don't want to speak up anymore because the stuff we've done hasn't worked for many, many times. Um, well, yeah, it, if an organisation is still running from a place of um, fear, then that's going to happen. But a part of becoming adaptive is trying to eliminate a culture of fear. Because if you are trying to maximise the autonomy of teams and the autonomy of individuals, you need them to be fully present. You need them to be fully engaged. Because they're making very important decisions for the company, for the organisation, for each other, for each of the team members, and the inter-team members. And so if you create a culture of fear where your experiment is going to fail, then they will hold back. <laughs> Of course, you, you know, of course, you're going to keep your head down, your team. So, so one of the things that, that part of the paradigm alignment is the idea of, of creating um, uh, high autonomy. I'm not going to go into the psychological safety at the moment, but that's part of it. So if you create, if you create high performing teams and high autonomous teams, you need to create the behavioural and social environment below it. Now, part of that is to be mistake embracing. And if you understand that in order to have a successful product, then you're going to have to have some failures. And we create the budgets for those failures and we create some of the metrics around those failures. And as long as we're learning, then that's fine. You know, that, that, you know theoretically, it's fine. But if we go the whole agile way, if we are running small experiments, these experiments are very small. They're, they're very, very small experiments. They're not bet the farm experiments. So instead of spending, you know, maybe five or ten million dollars creating a product, we're spending uh, fifty thousand, hundred thousand with, with an experiment. So we can really reduce the amount of risk. And each failed experiment, if it's done correctly, is a learning is something that we've learned. So we've tried to we've we, we've made an assumption about the market. We've gone out. We've created some a, 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 a prototype model or a beta a beta um, product. Uh, we put some websites up there. We haven't done much. We've just gauged interest. Got no interest. What does that do? It teaches us about our assumptions. Now. If a team is constantly making mistakes, is constantly not getting, there might be something wrong with, with the basic assumptions about the market. There might be something wrong with the delivery. But as long as the team is learning about that, then it, could, it should adapt. Thing is that if it's not, then, then there is a product market fit problem, which is not going to be solved by saying, make this product work <laughs> or you're fired. It's, it's going to be solved through adaptive processes. This, the problem that you're talking about is a really real one because um, finance officers and CFA, they don't like to report failures. They really don't like to report it. And so the, the thing is you have to keep on minimising the risk, minimising the risks. So you've heard of the concept of minimal viable products. Um, from, from Eric Rees. It's a really good little concept. Basically, it's a micro-experiment. And so the idea is to run these micro-experiments. And once the organisation starts to get into that habit, um, they start to wonder how we ever did it, how we could ever do it before. And the mistakes, uh, once an organisation gets past that, uh, it's, it's, it's just not an issue. You know, if you were to listen to executives at higher speaking and you, you, and you said, yeah, but what about the, the experiments that fail? They'd laugh at you. They go, that's fine. <laughs> Look at all the ones that worked. So this is higher, the, the um, white goods company you're talking about. Yeah, so what, so what have they done, John? Well, they've created, they've created a completely adaptive organisational model, which they call Rendon High. And what they've done is they break, they break the organisation down into cells, and their cells are called micro-enterprises. 
And so um, a micro enterprise can be two or three people, as small as two or three people producing, producing a product or producing an idea. And these micro enterprises um, collaborate with other micro enterprises synergi synergistically within, the, within their ecosystem, which they call it. Um, but it's, it's actually, it's, it's pretty radical. But what they really have done is they've, they've said two things. Let's create these micro enterprises. So the individuals inside those micro enterprises are, um, how would I say it? They're inducted into an entrepreneurial way of thinking. And so if a micro enterprise was to employ someone, rather than give them a share in that micro enterprise. The base wage would be very low. And most of the wage would come from the profit that's flowing through the micro enterprise. And so very quickly, <laughs> if, if, if it's a matter of putting bread on your table, that micro enterprise either wants to get successful or fail pretty quickly. And so they do. And the ones that fail, then what hire does is then takes those people that have failed and gives them um, a little bit of uh, a buffer, about three months at a base salary for them to go and find another opportunity somewhere within the business to go and redeploy their talents. And if they can't find someone, somewhere to, to go and find somewhere within about three months, then they're out of the organization. So a buffer, a buffer space and then a, a re opportunity to hire. So would you, would you regard hire as one of the the big success stories of an adaptive organization? Not one of the exemplar. It, it, it is, out of all of the ones I've studied, um, it's the one which has taken it to the next level. I watched a presentation from the CEO a few months ago and his opening slide <laughs> was autopoesis. I mean, <laughs> you know, he's creating an autopoetic company. I mean, it's just to the next level. Can you, can you just expand on that? What does that mean uh, to, uh, to, to a it's, listener who doesn't understand complexity science, John? It's, it's basically, it's, a, it's the self-organizing structure. So it comes from um, uh, South American biologist, Matrana Varela, and they've said, in order to, the difference between a living um, bunch of cells and a dead bunch of cells is this concept of autopoiesis. And autopoiesis means the ability to, so, it basically comes from self-writing. So it creates itself. So a giant tree comes from a tiny set of seeds because it's creating all of its different limbs and different parts automatically by itself without any external controlling influence as do all biology. So I'm just going to go to Oscar for a sanity check because I a lot of this stuff I know. So I'm just going to go straight to Oscar and, and see how well he's following and if he's got any other questions. <laughs> yeah, so the way... Um... I hear sort of two stories here, and just correct me if I'm wrong here, but the way I see this is that, John, the way you describe this is this process of, of uh, autonomous cells is a very intentional process. Um, Richard also mentioned about randomness, right? Things that are a little bit beyond your control. Um, I'm curious to, to hear from you in terms of the role of, let's like, decision making or what is an intentional conscious decision or unconscious decision that you make and how that would work in a business environment because what would the, the so you're talking that, about individuals decision making yeah because at the start you mentioned as a metaphor the body right where yeah. um, we regenerate cells um, but there's also a part in there you know that's conscious and unconscious um, the randomness that Richard was maybe referring to. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to understand what is the role of that unconscious decision making um, and what do you do with that? Because you can't control everything. Okay, so I, I, think you're, I think what you're saying, I don't really use the word conscious or the demarcation of conscious and unconscious. Decision. It's, not, it's not part of my, um, my language. But I think what you're talking about, I think, is between between rationality and kind of intuition. Is that, is that what you're talking about or, or not? Kind of. Um, there is, I guess, what you describe, I think, is very intentional, 
right? That, but that's the assumption that we control everything. But the, I, I, I mean, that's just my assumption is that there's also a part that you don't fully control. Um, that part, and, and maybe I refer to that as a sort of maybe the unconscious part, or you can use a different terms. Well, I think I'll, so to, I'll just add a little bit to Oscar's. So the, the right brain, left brain stuff in neuroscience, where the right brain controls the sort of the in, the attraction to ambiguity and uh, novelty, but doesn't doesn't do it in a conscious manner. It's just it gives you that willingness to step towards a novel or to explore. Um, whereas the left brain is the one that controls language and that's that rational conscious bit and that pushes it away. There's no, I don't understand that. That's scary. So, so I both think, things happening is the question. So I, I, I think it, I think the best way for me to answer this is to describe to you, I think is the best way, you correct me if I'm wrong, but to just describe to you what it's like working with highly autonomous high-performing team compared to a, a non-one. And so one of the first things, and I think it's a bit of a misnomer, that agile is thought of as being, um, or autonomy is thought of as being very loose, very, you know, let's we'll see what happens today. Nothing could be further from the truth. One of the things that you see when you enter a really effective team is how disciplined they are. I mean, a really effective agile team is highly disciplined. They don't start five minutes late for their meetings. They start on the clock. They don't, they don't go over time. They finish on the clock. Um, when they held a meeting, it's fast, but it's also effective. The, um, the level of, of um, awareness of each other's moods is very high. They, they will be reading each other's body language. Now I was saying, Oscar, you don't seem to be following me here. Do, 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 are you holding anything back? Um, they are incredibly focused on, on the key performance of what they're trying to produce which often translates into customer satisfaction. So they're highly, highly customer focused, whether that's an external customer or an internal customer. At the same time, with this discipline, you get this, this, this sense of incredible creativity going on and this incredible engagement. You know, people will come back and say, look, I, I woke up last night, I thought of this. In fact, I, I, I'm a bit tired, right? Because I, I coded it up. So at one stage, you get this incredible discipline and like, we're not going to break it, you know, at two o'clock on Friday, we are doing a demo, no matter how poor, and that's, and everyone works towards that. Everyone's fully engaged. Everyone's talking and sharing knowledge. Everyone's looking after themselves. The people are starting to get tired and say, hey, you know, um, Richard, I think you, you, you put in too many hours. To, you know, let, let me finish that off for you. They work very well, very, very well together as a team. And because of that, the collective computational output of that team is extraordinarily high. And so I think in some ways, the, the, the right brain is being that very rational part, saying, what do the customers need? Let's experiment, let's, you know, let's, let's drill these empirical processes. And then that part stops. And then they, they each go away into their own, um, you know, it depends on the team. Some, some of the teams are doing mob programming where they'll actually sit around the same computer screen and do, do it together. Others, Will, will kind of work on, the, on their own and they handle this creative space and there's this rhythm and there's this synchronization that's happening. And it really does, as from an observer, it really does look like this high performing organism unto itself. And the work they produce compared to the team sitting next door to which operating under bureaucracy, it's, it's just chalk and cheese. It's, I will, could just bottle that energy and, and somehow show people. So this, that's a very rational process, right? What you uh, describe. So where where would is there a role of irrationality as well, and where would that fit within that rational system? Um, well, 
I, I think what we're talking about is that creative. So I sort of said we, we were disciplined, but we're also creative. And so that, that, that creative energy is that entrepreneurial energy. How do we solve this problem? How do we, how do we, um, you know, how do we deliver this? And that, that there are unconscious processes, no doubt. And this is not my field of expertise, but there are, there are creative outputs that come out of this. Like all the time, I'm always amazed at, at the, the level of ingenuity and creativity which comes out of these teams, a different way to solve the problem, different way to look at it. You know, it's all this, this, this sense of novelty is, is effervescent. So I think a better way of framing it, again, might be uh, rather than unconscious, is, is spirit or a, a sort of a, a, an, almost an irrational faith that they can solve the problems that come at them before they've even experienced those problems. And of course, that, that, that irrational faith becomes more rational as, as they've experienced it time and time again, that they can do it. So there's, there's some kind of, uh, and I, I hesitate to use the term spiritual energy, but there's some kind of throw it at us, we can grow and, yes, and take it yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. There, there is a, with good teams, there is an absolute can-do attitude. Absolute can-do, absolute. And this entrepreneurial attitude. We can make, we can we can solve this problem, even though they they go into the problem without the solution set in mind. There, there is that energy. And that comes, of course, because from success, because they've done it again, they've done it in the past. And so if you, you do have this sort of sense that chuck the problem at me and, and we'll have something out in, in, in 48 hours. And so I, I, now have to, I now have, given, given the time we're recording this in, in sort of early February in the middle of a pandemic, um, what is sort of flexible work from home, COVID style work going to do to this incredible energy that you, you you're explaining i mean is, is it can we still have that when people are separate or do they need to be physically it, together it takes it takes a bit of a notch but but really you know video work with some with some disciplines around um you know video etiquette it's not an awful lot of difference you know in, in my work in the software world it's not an awful lot of difference uh, I mean, you're you're getting together. You're um, in terms of communication flow. The communication is flowing quite well. We can pick up, you know, nine tenths of the body language over video. Uh, I mean, in this part of the world, a lot of people don't put the videos on because they're very private people, which is a problem from trying to work with. Um, but but in in organisations where where video can be on and people can create a bit of a space. At the moment, I got my son and I locked him out of the this room would have been a life of video and he's a bit upset because his computer's right next to mine but there's a little bit of flex there's a little bit of negotiation and after this i'll after my client meeting i'll go into my into my little dark little cave and do my computer work it's honestly it's it's fine um you know, there, there is something about um you know the, the jeffrey west i think calls it from the complexity institute i think he calls it the um the fourth dimension of communication so um so you know, we can, we're communicating in 2D at the moment, but, and then 3D, 3D is face-to-face, -face, but there's a fourth dimension, something subtle which goes on, and it could be happening at an olfactory level or something like that. So it's possible, there is, we, we, you do lose some of that. But in pure processing terms, we can do very, very well with work from home. It's, it's, honestly, it's no problem. Oh. So to, to, to be sort of future fit, you mentioned, uh, John, um, this iterative process of experimentation. Um, from your experience, what, what holds, what are the barriers or what holds companies back to do this? Because it sounds very logic, but at the same time, there seems to be a lot of problems uh, adopting this. So... Um... You know, sorry to harp on again with the, this kind of concept of, of paradigm alignment, but if, but if you come from a, a paradigm or, or a, a, a interpretive framework or a cognitive framework where you believe that the only way to get a project done is to have one project manager, that's that's your that's your belief, that's your belief system, and everything around you confirms that belief system. You've got to have a project manager, and that project manager tells you what to do, which is your typical you know, waterfall type of project manager. If that's what you believe. 
then someone says, we're going to break this project into lots of little bits and the, the team's going to organise themselves, it doesn't make sense. That proposition just doesn't make sense to your world. You're, you're talking you're, you're crazy. You're, you're a nut. So, so what you've got to do is you've got to help that person go, well, this is what a project is, you know, it's, it's these things, and this is how decisions are made, this is how decisions are made in autonomous teams, and these are the things. And nine times out of ten, that person, once it's explained, they go, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. One of the problems with the Agile movement is that they... I have to be very careful here, because there's this... There's this the pure Agilists are fantastic. You know, the people are really, really, really thinking about this. They're a fantastic group. And then there's all the marketing people that go out there and try to, you know, sell courses and, and you know, they, they just put a, a marketing flavour on it and they... It's all theatre. Um, those people have done a very bad job of Agile. Because they'll come in and they say, Scrum's away, here's, here's Scrum, off you go. And they don't take any time to, to talk to, to the, the project manager who's had 25 or 30 years experience and really knows his stuff. And he's going, what are you talking about? If, on the other hand, you start and, and, and really explain how this works. And Agile is... is you know, the early days of Agile comes from um, statistical process control, which was in the 1930s. I mean, the, the core disciplines that Agile grabbed have been around for a long time. You know, the Toyota production management system. But once it's explained and explained how these work in, you know, sit them down, over, it doesn't take long, a couple of hours, really. Then what you've done is you help move their paradigm from you must have a top, a, you know, a single... Um, what are they going to a single butt to kick or, or one person in control? They go, okay, I can start to see how this happens. And that's, and that's the blockage. But if you don't help with, with paradigm migration, you're going to get blocked at every time. Or yes. someone will say you will do it, and these people will be looking for problems. Yeah, see, it didn't work, it didn't work, it didn't work. You're, you're taking me to the, the $9 trillion question here, John, which is, the which is our future world where all organisations operate like this. Right, so the way, can, the, can I get a purchase order number for that, please? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what we have, what we have here is, is it's quite interesting. To go back to Oscar's idea of the unconscious, we potentially have a, an irrational belief in, in a way of doing things, um, which is being challenged by a new paradigm, where, where, which is, um, you know, based by emerging science. And, and the reason I wanted to talk to you um, is because you're one of the people working on trying to make that science comprehensible to, to people who are, who, are, who are embedded in this sort of irrational model. And you've got, but you've got all of that it's emotionality. Not irrational to them. Not irrational to them. It's not irrational. No, it, no, no, not irrational to them, but I mean, it's a model that, that is, Given the way the world is going, it's potentially an irrational model, and but they're they're holding on to it. It's maladapted. maladapted. Okay, maladapted is a better word, yeah. But they're holding on to this with with all of their emotional energy, and yes, of most course. of the language coming at them is totally incomprehensible from the other side. And I think you're in the middle trying to do something interesting about this. So the nine the nine trillion dollar question is. You succeed. So according, you succeed and you, your, your language gets more and more people jumping on to this complex adaptive systems uh, version of organisation. What does the future look like if that happens? So the future would then, you, you've got to kind of imagine... Um, So organizations become nodes in a much larger organization, which we would call a market um, or an economy. And so the, 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 the boundaries between organizations will break down. Um, there'll be a lot more network meshing and symbiotic um, relationships between organizations and symbiotic relationships between organizations and individuals. Because um, it's kind of the way, <laughs> without getting too, too, too complex, it's kind of the, it, it's, it's the, it's the way it's going to evolve. So if you can think about 
a rainforest, which is a complex adaptive system. And a rainforest is made up of a whole bunch of what we call species or individuals. And those individual, you know, those species are, they exist in the soil and they exist, they are plants and they're animals and there's, they exist in the canopy. And so there's all these different niches. And those are adaptive agents that are part of a larger system, which is the rainforest, which is also adapting. And so the organizations of the future are ones that are adapting to an adapting environment, an organizational environment, a market. So my last question before passing to Oscar for a last sentence. Did you ask is, a question at all? Or is that no, no, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, but I want, I want to sort of go um, within that, again, before passing back to Oscar for a last sanity check, within that, what's the human experience of working within this kind of system? So if I'm, a, if I'm a, a young person moving into the market and I've got a choice of an organization playing around with these complex adaptive systems versus a, a more old school kind of hierarchical bureaucracy, what's the experiential difference? So, you know, if you, if you want to be a laborer and I've got no, that's no problem, you know, like let's, there are some people, you know, my son, he just doesn't want to, you know, he wants to keep his brain for after work, my older son. And he's, he, after work, he plays music, but during the day, he doesn't want to think. He just wants to, you know, cart stuff. Now, in some ways, um, a hierarchical organization is very suited to that because he doesn't have to think. Whereas a complex adaptive organization, you're pushing decision-making down to the individual. So a person who's going to go into a complex adaptive organization like Hire, they've got to think for themselves a lot. They've got to be very autonomous themselves. They've got to be very self-reliant themselves. They've got to be like entrepreneurs. I mean, um, the CEO of Hire, one of his visions was he wants to make every single employee a CEO. Not just a metaphor, but in charge of a business. And I think that that's the actually the future. So for the individual who wants to become part of these complex adaptive, they have to become very entrepreneurial. Whereas if you'd rather have your creative energies outside of that, then maybe you would go towards a traditional organization that just pays your, pays your wage so that you can go and have a life outside of that organization. Maybe you can do both, but there's a few different pathways for you. Cool, thank so, you, Oscar. So if, if everyone is an entrepreneur, like uh, say everyone is a CEO, so is then the future is of leadership is basically leaderless because everyone is a leader. Yeah, it's highly distributed. It's highly distributed. Um, and so um, you're making, you know, the, 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 the thing which has come out of the VUCA research with the military was that no single individual has got the capacity for the situational awareness and the, and the knowledge to make decisions in this environment. It's, it, it's got to, decisions have got to be made collectively. And that's exactly the same with, with organizations and businesses. You, we have to make decisions collectively. And that can go all the way down to the cell level. So a cell is you know, more than one person. And a cell could be one person, depending on how you, how you draw your map. Um, so, sorry, I've, I've, I started and I've lost my train of thought. How did you, how did you what was the original no, I, I was just, no, uh, just uh, throwing up this question about no leaderless leadership, if everyone is Yeah, so leader, leader. Leader, I like Heifert's idea that, that leadership is a task, not a role. It's something that anyone can do at any time. And that should be encouraged. All right, John uh, and Richard, uh, thanks again. Uh, it was a really fascinating uh, discussion. Um, it's, it's, uh, I really love this uh, discussion around complexity, although I'm, I think I only know the tip of the iceberg, but which makes, makes it even more interesting. Um, Richard, any last words? No, just to say thanks to John. Uh, again, I think, I think the mission you're on to try and demystify this and, and turn it into something that... It, it, a, a 
a greater number of people can engage with is, is a fantastic mission. Thank you very much. Always enjoyable to talk to you too.